to welcome you all tonight. It's so exciting to actually be here in person. Um, I think I've been missing this. I, I think a lot of people have been. Um, Jefferson County Public Schools, of course, is requiring masks, no exceptions, um, except for the speakers that are up on the stage. So um, those, are, those will be the only ones without masks on tonight. Um, but we would really like to um, welcome you, um, and we very much appreciate you being here. Um, a very special thanks to Christy and Tiffany with Remax Alliance for their community support of tonight's town hall meeting. And I'd also like to thank Sharon Trill of My Mountain Town for videotaping tonight's meeting. And you and others will have a chance to um, view this meeting again, um, probably in the next day or so. So we'll, we'll have a link on our website, and we'll also be sending out an email to everyone um, that is on our list. If you are not on our list, there is a sign-up sheet in the back, and, and or you can go to uh, the conifarycouncil.org website, go to contact us, and then um, just sign up, and you, you can get, get all of our um, emails. So um, our speakers tonight have been asked to present just the facts not in support or opposition to any development, ballot issue, or anything else. And um, most of you have been here many, many times. I can't really tell, because I can't tell who you are with your masks on, so sorry. But anyway, I think a lot of you have been here before, and some of you haven't. So if you haven't, we do not take any comments or questions during any of the presentations. But right at about 8 o'clock, we'll go to an open house format, and at that point, um, you can ask any questions of the speakers that you'd like to. So with that, I um, would like to talk about what's going on around here. Um, first of all, we have Peggy Catlin, um, the first vice chair and director of RTD. Peggy. It is nice to be here in person after all these months, and I'll try to be brief. Um, RTD has hired a new general manager, and we're just making sweeping changes in terms of how we do business, and she's just a dynamo. Um, lots of energy, lots of great ideas. She hails from Long Beach, California, and just brings some really good transit expertise, so we're thrilled to have her. Um, one of the first things we did when she was hired was embark upon a strategic plan. Those are the um, four strategic priorities being community value, customer excellence, employee ownership, and financial success. And we can see what those um, mean. Uh, the other thing that she embarked upon, because many of you and others in our area complained about the complexity of our fair structure, and we have so many different fairs and so many different past programs. And so she embarked upon a study to not only um, look at the equity of those, but also look at the, um, oops, I guess I, look at the, um, the reducing the complexity a little bit. So that's how I'm going right now. And those changes should come out in 2023. We continue to be involved in a, a whole reimagine of RTD, looking at at what RTD means for the future. Um, and there are a number of community engagement uh, opportunities for you all to weigh in on what you would like RTD to look like. And I think for this particular area, it's, it's very, very challenging because you all contribute to sales tax dollars and yet service has just been stripped from, from this area. And I, I'm working to try and, and uh, do something about that, but part of the reimagining process might be what other types of service can we provide if we don't provide the long buses. Um, so, speaking of service changes, there are meetings coming up, um, the public meetings for January service changes. And um, I wanted to let you know that, that the um, two routes to the Mount communities, the CV and the um, Evie have been reinstated as well as some of the southern Jeff 
County to the 99 and the 100. So there are now opportunities for you all to commute from here um, into Civic Center uh, Station. And that just started September 5th. So I would encourage you to encourage your neighbors and friends to um, get on board and ride our TV once again. So that's all I have. Um, you can always provide input at these medium meetings, and I want to thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Peggy. And next, um, some of you already know her, but those of you who don't, I would like you to introduce you to Brittany LaRue. Is that how you say that? <laughs> Brittany LaRue is the new executive director of the Confer Area Chamber of Commerce. Brittany. Hello, everybody. I'm going to give a very just kind of brief update. Um, thank you, Shirley, for inviting me here tonight. Um, I am the new executive director of the Conqueror Area Chamber of Commerce. I'm um, very excited to be here. I'm entering my second month. Um, very excited to finally be working in the area in which I live. Um, we got some exciting stuff happening. Tomorrow night, I highly encourage you guys to go to goconifer.com and register for our after hours mixer. This is going to be a unique one. Um, we have six different uh, area um, businesses in the Kings Valley, Major Link, Compass Real Estate, Kings Emporium, Conifer Jazzer Size Center, PeaceWorks, and Uri's Mountain Bakery Cafe. Um, they're going to be hosting our after hours mixer. Um, so stop on by from 5 to 7 p.m. We also have um, some upcoming events in November. We have our Festival of Trees. We have our annual uh, Christmas Parade in December, happening September 17th through October 3rd, our Gold Rush. Um, that's where local businesses will have different specials, um, hopefully to capture some of the uh, traffic coming through to look at the local um, leaf peeping, if you will. Uh, we have, we're starting back up again, our small, small networking group on October 4th. Um, you can find all that information again on goconifer.com. And then, uh, as a reminder, we do have for um, our residents, we do have a resident guide, um, which is also on our website. It's free. You can find local businesses, different local uh, eateries. We have just started posting um, different businesses, their jobs. Um, right now, some of our businesses are struggling to find um, employees. So if you have any kiddos who are looking for jobs from after school, uh, definitely go there, uh, see what we have. Upcoming on October 6th, we have a Mountains Community Job Fair. Um, there's going to be a lot of local communities from Conifer, Evergreen, um, Bailey Pine, uh, will be held at uh, Our Lady of the Pines Church. October 6th, again, from 9 to 4 p.m. Um, come out. Uh, we'll be doing in-person job interviews that day also. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Brittany, and welcome to Confer. So next we have Jessica Paulson. Um, Jessica is the public... Um, services Manager for the Mountain Libraries, and she's going to be talking a little bit about the Conifer Area Library. Jessica. Hi, everyone. Um, as she said, I'm Jessica Paulson. I manage the Conifer Evergreen locations for Jefferson County Libraries. Um, thanks for letting me be here tonight. I wanted to let you know that Conifer Libraries hours have changed a little bit beginning this week. We are now opening at 3 p.m. Monday through Thursday. At the request of the school, there was a little bit more overlap this year. And so for safety and security reasons, um, we're building in a little bit of a break there. To make up that time, we are opening on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. So if you have any free time on Sundays, come on down and tell us what kind of programming that you like. Our big push system-wide here in the month of September is Raise a Reader. So we celebrate early literacy, um, ages zero through five. Um, we have a really cool program coming up on Friday evening. 
It's um, by two Colorado authors, a couple. Uh, the husband is the um, the author, and the wife is the illustrator. Um, so it's an online program, so please come check it out on Friday night. Um, and if you have any young kiddos in your lives, you know, please come to the library and get an activity bag, or just really emphasize those early literacy skills. Thank you. Huh. Oh, so, Jessica, thank you very much. The library always has so many things, wonderful things going on. Um, as many of you know, um, Conifer Area Council actually facilitated a Conifer Library Services service survey recently. And um, Susie Nelson is here to talk a little bit about what has resulted from that, um, what Conifer Area Council has done to promote that, and all of your, um, your survey results. Susie. Okay, earlier this year, Conifer Area Council conducted a survey about library needs in our area. We got 560 responses, with 93% supporting a full service library. Community members responded that their most important reasons for supporting a full service library was to extend hours and library hours that fit their schedules. So, other concerns about the current library included parking and accessibility. Currently, Conifer shares our library with the Conifer area, uh, sorry, the Conifer High School. Conifer public patrons have library access beginning at 3 p.m. on weekdays with a total of 36 public hours per week. Eight Jefferson County public libraries are open 58 hours weekly, and the ninth one is open 52 hours. The other six public libraries in Colorado that share a building with a school give priority to public patrons. But some designated hours for students, or some have designated hours for students, or may have separate entrances that accommodate each group, the students and the public. Conifer is the only combined library that excludes the school gate count from the total public library gate count. This practice diminishes Conifer's use and value to the community and to the Jefferson County Public Library. According to the Colorado State Library, this practice is not dictated by the state, as reported by Jefferson County Public Library staff. Public library staff. The Conifer Library has been part of the Jefferson County Public Library system since 1954, yet has never been housed in its own facility. All other Jefferson County Public Libraries have their own buildings, owned or rented by Jefferson County Public Library, and most have undergone extensive remodeling since their inception. In 2011, the Conifer Library Committee reported that the budget for the Conifer Library was less than 1% of the Jefferson County Public Library budget. In 2020, it was 0.41%, less than half of point no, less than half of 1%. All Conifer property owners pay the same 4.5 bills in property taxes as the rest of the county's property owners to support the library. The community asked the county to accelerate the timeline to build or acquire a standalone Conifer library, including it in the 2025 to 2030 budget. Well, <laughs> that was what we were asking for, and that funds be allocated in the upcoming budget year to bring this to fruition. In June, the library executive team recommended new libraries for Northwest Arvada and Lakewood at Quincy and Kipling, with a large increase in administrative space. No mention of a standalone library in Conifer is in the budget. The Library Administration and Board intend to review the facility's master plan this fall. A list of library contacts is included in this presentation. As you walked in, you uh, got a handout with all the development updates, and uh, that list is attached to the, the um, updates, the list of contacts. So our video, which we were unable to present tonight, because of technical difficulties, 
will be on our website. And that website is conifertareacouncil.org. So, along with, with uh, the video we were going to present, um, it, are the survey results. And it's all on our website, and the library contact list is attached to the update sheet. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susie. So, Contemporary Council has done several um, comprehensive surveys over the years, but also um, when we know that there is something of, you know, a need in the Confer community or, or people would like to see, um, we do specific surveys. So we did that Confer Area Library survey a few months ago. Um, we are also right now working on a trail survey. We actually sent that out last April, um, but we only had seven responses. So. Um, we are going to send that out again, so we want you to know that that will be going out um, to our general email list, and we'll be getting out, out a lot of different places, too. Um, so, again, you need to get on our email list, um, and, you know, sign up at the door. There is a, is a sign-up sheet there, so we'd love it if you would um, do that. <laughs> Angela's telling me that my minute's up, so... I need to be booted off the stage, I guess. Anyway, so next we have Heather Gutherless, who is a senior long range planner with Jefferson County Planning and Zoning. And she's going to talk a little bit about the plan development um, for the Conifer area and how you can be involved. Heather. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see everyone here tonight in person. It's been a long time. Tonight, I'm going to talk about a lot of the projects that Jefferson County Planning and Zoning is doing and also give you an update on many of the development proposals that are happening in the community. So first, I'm going to go over several of the projects, the bigger picture projects that we're working on. And one of the ones that I wanted to talk about is the Alternate Energy Resources Regulation Amendment. It was passed this summer by the Board of County Commissioners, and with that update, we focused on the non-commercial wind energy conversion systems, which is basically a residential wind turbine. And with the regulation amendments, all new permits for these types of turbines would be going to our Board of Adjustment through a special exception, a special exception process to get either a decision for approval or denial. I also wanted to let you guys know about a recent update that we're just starting out on, and that is regulation updates regarding wildfire. We do currently have a wildfire hazard overlay district in our zoning resolution, and we want to update that. That's going to be done in two phases. The first phase is going to be um, more dealing with some ones that we think are more straightforward types of updates, such as making sure the defensible space permits apply to all building permits, and then also including road fire breaks along roads in with defensible space permits, and increasing our standards for fire protection when somebody comes in for a building permit. With our second phase, we would be looking at updating our wild our wildland, inter our wildland urban interface map and making sure that it, that is current and making sure that uh, we work with the experts in wildfire and with the fire districts to come up with a map that is the most appropriate. We also have presented to you several other regulation updates that we're working on. Uh, we have been very short-staffed, as a lot of other agencies and businesses have been. Um, this summer, it's extremely busy, and we've been short-staffed. So some of our projects have been taking a little bit longer than typical. We are still working on potential changes to our short-term rental regulations. We're still working on changes to our water regulations. Uh, we're, look we're looking at changes to our zoning resolution and relief of some of the standards. Uh, permits for sheds and fences and altering some of those standards. 
Our land disturbance permits and floodplain overlay districts are being run by our engineers and we're looking at some changes to those areas. So on to the specific development cases. There are currently 26 cases that are ongoing in the Codifer area. I'm not going to talk about all of those tonight, just some of the ones that are either new or that have some updates. So first I'm going to talk about some pre-applications that are going on. Pre-applications are very early in the process. They are basically to give an applicant, an owner, an idea of what the process might be, what hurdles they might come across, what the issues might be as, as they decide whether or not to move forward with their proposal. And sometimes a lot of people don't go through with the proposal after hearing about what the process is and what some of the issues might be. We typically see about 40 to 50 percent of the uh, applications, pre-applications, don't actually move forward to a formal application. So the first one that I want to talk about, and all the numbers on the screen correspond with the list that is in the handout. So pre-application number seven is a new one since the last time we met. And this is in the Homestead area. This is probably of high interest to a lot of people. It is for a commercial recreation center with both indoor and outdoor facilities. And it is right near 285 and Homesteader Road on 3.19 acres. And right now there has been no community meeting scheduled with the county. It's our understanding there has been a community meeting that the developer did, but the county was not a part of that. If they do move forward, they would need to do a, another community meeting with county representation. Pre-application number eight is up off of Richmond Hill Road in that area. It is 26 acres and the proposal is to rezone and then subdivide it into five acre lots, or five single family lots, sorry. The plan recommendation for this area is one dwelling unit per five acres with some special wildfire considerations. And so far this has not moved forward in the process either. Pre-application number nine is by the old Safeway Center uh, off of 285 and Highway uh, County Road or County Highway 73. It is a proposal to allow for 16,000 square feet of warehouse and office space on five acres. This one is kind of interesting because they are in the rezoning process. They are allowed to come in and see what it would take to then build if their property is rezoned to allow for the warehousing uses. The last pre-application that I was going to talk about is Zoka's Restaurant and Bar. That's down in Pine Grove area. And what they want to do is a site development plan to construct a detached structure and have a beer garden. And this is something where they don't have to rezone, the zoning is already in place to allow these types of uses, so the plan doesn't apply, the community plan doesn't apply in this area, uh, but they do have to go through a county process in order to do this. Next I want to talk about a, a few rezoning cases that have been updated in the Conifer area. The slide shows the rezoning process, but basically a rezoning is a case where somebody wants to change the allowed use on their property. So maybe they want to go from an agricultural use to either a commercial use or maybe a more higher intensity residential use. Then they have to go through the rezoning process. And with that rezoning process, they're evaluated against both the criteria in our zoning resolution and against the comprehensive master plan and Conifer 285 corridor area plan. The first rezoning that I wanted to give an update on is related to one of those pre-apps that I talked about. The, this is a rezoning, this is behind the old Safeway Center near Highway 73 and 285, and this is the rezoning to allow for some warehousing and outdoor storage uses. The applicant was scheduled for hearings, but then there were some outstanding issues that they wanted to address, and so they decided to continue their case. They're still addressing outstanding issues and we have not heard whether they're going to reschedule their hearings at this point. Then another rezoning behind the new Safeway Center is the proposal to allow for 188 residential units. And I know this is another 
case of interest up in this area. And it's a similar situation to the one before where they were going to schedule hearings, they had some outstanding issues that they wanted to address, so the hearings were canceled, and they are still working on addressing those outstanding issues. There's no hearings scheduled for this case at this point in time. The last rezoning that I wanted to update you on is actually not on the list because it is a rezoning where they made a formal application and then they decided that they did not want to pursue this rezoning. This property is up in the Turkey Creek area near High Drive and let's see, what is that, Valley, Valley Drive, I think it is. And they have withdrawn this rezoning case for, um, it was for additional residential units. The last case that I wanted to talk about is a subdivision plat. Subdivision plat process is a, is a process where the zoning, the land uses are already in place and the, the property owner wants to then come in and develop under those zoning regulations, maybe divide the land, well, that's what it is, dividing the land and figuring out where those lot lines are gonna be. So the subdivision plat that I wanted to update you on is one in the Homestead area near 285 and right along 285 near Homesteader. And it was a plat to create nine two-acre residential lots. It was zoned for that. And the Board of County Commissioners did approve that plat in August. Those are all the updates I have for you tonight. Uh, Kayla Bryson from our division and I are over at the table to answer any questions that you might have later. Thank you. And you have all of that information in your packet. If you have any questions about any one of those cases, um, you have phone numbers and emails and everything, contact information to find out more and to get involved. So hopefully that helps. Um, next, we have Park Manager Zach Taylor. Is Zach here? <laughs> Hi, Zach. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see you and I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't tell if it was you. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was trying to hide in the corner. She doesn't work out well for me. Uh, typically, I'm off in the woods, and it's way better. Uh, so first off, I'm Zach Taylor. I'm the park manager at Staunton State Park. I'd like to start these off with a raise of hands of who's been to Staunton State Park. I usually get that kind of reaction. It's awesome. Um, if you enjoyed your trip, please let your legislative representatives and the county commissioners know. If you have not enjoyed your trip, please let me know. I'm the one that can help you fix it. Uh, maybe. Um, with that being said, we celebrated and finished up another huge season at the park. Uh, we saw some uh, extraordinary numbers with visitors. Uh, probably 75% are still new and have not seen the park before, so first time users. Um, our numbers were down from 2020. As you can imagine, everybody was excited to get outside. Um, but they're up from 2019, so we're still seeing the growth in the park. Um, we uh, actually celebrated um, our 1,000th track chair trip this year. So if you haven't heard of that, it's our motorized wheelchair. Yep. Yeah, it's a program that offers up a motorized wheelchair for disabled users to get out and go for hiking in the park. And so it's been ongoing for about five years, supported through the Friends of Stompton State Park. It's a free to everybody program with the entrance of the park. Um, so yeah, we take our visitors out on up to nine miles of trails on these motorized wheelchairs. So we're super excited about that program and celebrated that 1,000th trip. Um, the Friends of Staunton actually met with them today and they're working on purchasing an extra chair for us. Uh, we were able to donate one of our chairs to Bar Lake State Park near Brighton in Adams County. Uh, and they actually purchased a second chair for themselves. So we've expanded our program from just Staunton State Park um, to an additional park and it's up at, at, at Bar Lake State Park. Um, I did want to talk about, if you have been to the park recently, um, some construction that's been going on. Uh, we're in the process of wrapping up a new road project, so about two more miles of road. I'll take everybody to the middle of the park, which provides access to uh, more access to our western edge of the park. Uh, we're wrapping up construction of some of our trails, getting our signs updated, getting some posts on the ground. Um, and our hope is that either later this fall, if not the first of the year, We'll get that road open to the public and expand that accessibility to more folks throughout the rest of the park. I did briefly want to touch base before Angela dances around and kicks me off the stage. Um, to be very aware, obviously we're entering into that fall season, so please be uh, cognizant of, of when you place your trash out or if you have trash outside, bring it inside at night. 
um, and then obviously take it outside early in the morning so that we can reduce the risk of bears getting into your trash and either having to relocate or put those bears down based on those activities. So uh, we like to, to keep our bears wild, so if you guys can do that, tell your neighbors, share the message, you know, keep, keep the, the bears wild, keep Colorado wild, wild, keep your trash inside. The last thing I want to say before I step off is obviously, um, I'd say we wrapped up our summer season, but we're ramping up for our leaf peeper season. I'm not sure who mentioned leaf peeper, but yeah, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Yeah. So as my staff starts to dwindle and goes back to school, we're going to ramp back up to get everybody back out to the park to enjoy the wonderful fall colors that will happen in Stone. So hopefully we see those of you that have not come to the park, and certainly see those that have come for a return visit. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. So that is a wonderful place to be. Um, Highway 285 sometimes is not. Um, as you know, we had a fatal crash, a horrible crash, not too long ago. And so we have two gentlemen here from CDOT. Um, we have Region 1 West Program Engin Engineer Mike Kellerman and Kings Valley Project Manager Brian Meyer with Colorado Department of Transportation. Well, hello everybody, my name is Mike Hellman, and I, I, I feel like I'm yelling into the microphone, so I'll put it down here. Uh, I, I work with CDOT, as is Brian. Um, I think in the past you've had uh, Janice Spiker from our office come up here and talk to you. Um, she couldn't be here tonight. When I asked her why, she looked me in the eye and said, I have to plan my wedding. So I knew that I, I had to say yes, otherwise I'd be in big trouble if I told her she needs to be up here. So uh, at, it's my understanding usually Jane will give you updates along um, all of 285. But as it was just brought up, you know, we're, we're very aware of the recent accident and the accident history at Kings Valley. And so uh, we wanted to come here tonight and talk to you about what we've been doing, what we've been planning, uh, what we've been doing for the last couple of years, and then also what our future plans are for this intersection, as I'm sure many of you sitting in the audience uh, wondering what's going on. I will say, um, also after the accident, uh, we received numerous emails and phone calls, uh, you know, asking us questions, what, what does CDOT intend to do? And so uh, that's why Brian and I are here tonight, and uh, I want to hand it off to Brian, because he's, he's the guy who does all the heavy lifting, um, and has really dived, uh, you know, has dived in, in, into this project. He's, he's into the details. So. Thanks, Mike. Uh, my name is Brian Meyer. I'm the project engineer on the Kings Valley project. Um, and just to get everyone up to speed, here we run through the history of the Kings Valley uh, intersection and how this came about. So it started off with an EA, or what we call an environmental assessment back in 2004, um, and basically that just scratches the surface, starts looking at what's actually feasible, what can we do, um, a traffic perspective or environmental perspective, what projects can we actually consider uh, before diving into the engineering. So from this environmental assessment, um, there's a couple of recommendations, but uh, seven of, excuse me, seven grade separated interchanges were called out in this environmental assessment, one of them being Kings Valley. In addition to that, this EA also calls out four through lanes to widening with a 22 foot wide depressed median, so separating both directions of travel. Um, and we wanted to highlight some of the projects that we've completed so far. Uh, we've done interchanges at Richmond Hill, Deer Creek, and Shaver's Crossing. And we've also widened and done that uh, 22 foot wide depressed median from Foxham Road to Richmond Hill. Uh, so uh, we started diving into the Kings Valley project. This uh, was the preferred alternative from the environmental assessment. Uh, we brought this to 30% design in 2019, where we uncovered that there's a historic property that's impacted by this project. So because we were running into before I do that, let me give you, some, give you some context as to what's going on here in the photo. So let's give this. You know how this works. So if you were going to drive down to Bailey, you'd be heading in this direction. Heading to Denver, you'd be heading in this direction. And this is the come and go gas station. Uh, 
So just to run through some traffic patterns, head north down and want to get off to Kings Valley, make a right turn from here, come up and around, and you'd be able to access it that way. Uh, and so that gives you some, some perspective as to where exactly the saddle is at, how it'll function, and things like that. Uh, so because we're impacting a historic property from this project, uh, it's, there's a federal process that's triggered. Uh, it's called the 4F historic process. And that requires us to look at alternatives that don't impact these historic properties. And so that brings us where we're at today with reevaluating the Kings Valley area and seeing if we can avoid these historic properties. Uh, we're expecting to wrap that up uh, in the coming months here. I uh, encourage you to go to the project website here to make sure we're up to speed and so you guys kind of have an idea of what's going on. So after that analysis is completed, we'll jump into design. That design is going to take us from roughly winter of this year through fall of 2023, and that's going to allow us to get through all the processes that we need to in right away. If there's any historic impacts, we can figure out the best way to mitigate them and things like that. And then lastly, that will lead us into construction season after design wraps up from fall 2023 to roughly summer of 2025. Um, so we understand that that's a ways down the road and we want to make some improvements now. So some of the things that we're doing are going to be happening in the coming weeks, if not they've already been completed. So the first one here is this warning signage. And so these are Chevron signs, and they let drivers know, hey, there's curves coming down, you've got to slow down. The second thing we're doing is actually a speed study. So currently it's posted at 55 miles an hour going through the Kings Valley area. And so the speed study is going to look at dropping that speed limit from 55 miles an hour to 45 miles an hour. We're also looking at adding rumble strips, and so those drive your car on, it's really uncomfortable, it's loud, and kind of shakes your car, so you know you're leaving the lane, so just another safety thing. Um, and about a month ago, we restriped the front of the road and the stop bars, uh, so that was done, I think, the 16th of last month. And the last thing that we're really going to do in, in this like near-term time is having safety edge improvements. So We've got some areas on the side of the road where there's a little bit of a gap and it can be hard to recover your vehicle if it comes off. So this would allow us to have better safe driving, drivers be able to recover if they do veer off the road a little bit. So that will jump to the final link. Okay, thank you for that answer. Uh, one thing I just wanted to clarify that Brian was talking about was when we we had that original design that he showed you up there, and there was a historical property there. And he, it is a, a FHWA requirement that we stop, you know, okay. and, and take a look and reevaluate. And so that's where the, the star is right there with the circle on it. Out of that process, then we're required to go back to the books. I just want to clarify this and make sure that it makes sense and take a look at other designs that would avoid this this property here. Um, so right now we're taking a look at three different, I think, three different designs where we would take uh, 285 and go under Kings Valley, basically build a bridge you know, on grade from Kings Valley and 285 and go underneath it. We're looking at another option where we would take 285 up and over Kings Valley. And then there's another uh, third option uh, where we would uh, look at moving the intersection a little bit closer to the, the, the actual intersection itself, uh, the come and go in that area there. So that's what we're required to do. Um, and then, you know, obviously, if you're raising or lowering 285, uh, there, there's a price tag associated with that. And so then we'll have to take a look at that and, 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 and see what we have the money for and what is the best design for the project. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. And so we're optimistic that we can figure out which, which design best suits this intersection, minimizes the impacts, makes it as safe as possible. And then it's my job to, to, to go find the money and to, to build this project. I will say this project is on our, our CETA has a 10 year pipeline of projects. This project has been on there. Uh, it's, it's widely supported from my management, and I know most of the citizens here support it. So it has good momentum. We have a little bit of, of money already in here, $6.2 million. So that's always good when you have some money 
in a project. And so um, right now I'm optimistic that we have two parallel paths here. One is figuring out what the final design is, and then the other one is is is, is finding the money. So we're not going to finish the design and then go great. Now we need $25 million, let's go find it. We're hoping to hit the finish line at, at the same time. We know what the design is, and then we know how much money we need, and we're able to find that money. So. That, that's all we had tonight. Uh, we'll, we'll be standing around Friday night in the back in case you have other questions, as I'm sure most folks will. We're happy to answer those. And I'm going to hand it back to you. Thank you, Mike and Brian. And I'm sure you have questions, so please come up and, and ask when you need to. Um, next, we have a short update um, at what's happening at the Colorado State Legislature. Um, we have Senator Tammy Story first. Tammy. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in person and nice to um, be be able to welcome all of you back and I just want to do a quick shout out to Shirley Johnson for all the work that she does in pulling these uh, meetings together for us. My name is Tammy Story and I represent Senate District 16 which includes the area of Conifer and Evergreen, it's uh, all the foothills of Jeffco west of C470 um, more or less in southern Boulder County, all of Gilpin, and the southwest corner of Denver. Um, so I just want to share a really brief update about what I've been up to during the interim period, which is while we are out of session. I serve on three year-round committees. One of them is the Capital Development Committee, where we work on um, all of our buildings, state buildings that require um, capital improvements, construction, maintenance, and so forth. So that would include buildings like the Capitol itself, um, the Legislative Services Building, Department of Revenue, multiple other um, state buildings like that, but also includes all of the buildings in the Department of Corrections, all of the buildings that are on, on our um, public institutions of higher education, and also all of our buildings and parking lots that are part of the um, uh, state park um, entity. So, um, it's, it's uh, quite a lot of work, but it's good to be on that committee to be able to have an opportunity to um, hopefully provide opportunity, um, provide uh, the funding that's needed for the improvements that are out there. I also serve year-round on the advisory committee to the Colorado Commission on Higher Education, and I also serve year-round on the Gaming Impact Advisory Committee. Um, I serve on two committees um, this season during the interim. One's the Wildfire Re uh, Matters Review Committee, and we are obviously looking at all things um, that have to do with wildfire, um, anywhere, anything from mitigation to suppression, as well as uh, recovery at the back end. I know you'll all hear more about that from Representative Cutter when she steps up in a few minutes, as she's chair. I also serve on the Early Childhood and School Readiness Legislative Commission. We are very focused on early childhood care where we have a um, significant shortage of child care, licensed child care centers across the state. Um, it's not uncommon across the entirety of the country. And so we are working on policy to help mitigate that um, as well. And then during the, um, during the session, I serve on two committees, the Senate Education Committee, where I'm Vice Chair, and also on the Senate Local Government Committee, where I'm also Vice Chair. Um, just as an FYI, I host a number of town halls. One of them uh, we do collectively with Commissioner Dahlkemper, as well as Representative Cutter, the Jeffco Foothills um, Town Hall. So I've done that one, also in Superior, one in Golden, uh, up in Gilpin and also Denver. And I have been meeting uh, regularly with stakeholders and working on policy for bills for next year. One thing that I wanted to cover real quick is about the uh, significant weather event we had back in February over President's Weekend. I imagine most of you uh, remember that. It was really, really cold and um, you know, put a strain on our energy utilities where they had to purchase additional fuel, natural gas or electricity, 
in order to meet the public need. Um, and they bought this at um, a premium, considerably higher prices than they normally would buy. So uh, each um, utility is also working or has presented a recovery plan in order to recover those costs that they spent for that three days of wicked weather that we had. And the utilities are all um, having hearings. Excel had theirs last week, but Colorado Natural Gas has one tomorrow. And, um, and I would urge you to participate for just a little bit of additional information. Um, Excel, for example, they're anticipating uh, charging customers an additional almost $70 for the average residential electric customer, and also nearly $150 for the average residential natural gas customer over a period of time from two to five years. And Colorado Natural Gas is doing the same kind of thing, but they are anticipating um, almost $250 for the average natural gas customer um, over a period of five years. And I don't know what your natural gas bill is like, but there may be people out there in the winter who pay a $200 uh, monthly bill in the winter. So this $250 is essentially another month's worth of natural gas that they want to charge you for for those three days. So I would urge you to um, get involved and participate. Come see me after the meeting. I'd be happy to share some information with you about how you can do it um, remotely, because it's all remote, or submit written testimony. And um, just a couple of the things that you can um, share about are the impacts of the increased rates, the lack of conservation messaging to customers to encourage them to reduce usage and save themselves money, the combined impacts of increased rates through this case, COVID, multiple rate cases, or other cost increases proposed by the company, and other concerns they may have with the business, you may have with the business practices of the company. So I urge you to get involved because this is definitely going to impact your bill if you um, are served by Colorado Natural Gas or Excel for your electricity or your natural gas. Um, you can reach out to me through um, my email. It's senator.tammy.story at gmail.com. And like I said, I'll be around here and we'd be happy to get you additional information about tomorrow afternoon's um, hearing and opportunity for you to share your thoughts. Well, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate it. Sorry, we have sleeves for the microphone tonight. It's making a lot of noise. We apologize. Um, Want to do everything we can to stay safe. Anyway, um, thank you, Tammy. And now we have Lisa Cutter, our representative. Lisa. Thank you so much, Shirley. And um, it's really nice to see everyone here tonight. I want to acknowledge, first of all, that it's been a really hard year for various reasons. A hard, what, 10 years it feels like. <laughs> but I know people have been struggling with different things, and that's something that um, our office is always happy to help with. If there's anything that you still need, um, any services or anything as a result of the pandemic or otherwise, please always reach out to our office. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, if you're a Republican, it doesn't matter if you're a constituent, we are here to help you, and that is truly what we take a lot of pleasure in doing. So please reach out. Um, the easiest way to find me is through our legislative website, um, ledge.gov.colorado, or you can go to my personal website, Cutter for Colorado. So we're pretty easy to find um, at the State House, so hopefully you will reach out and connect with me. And also if you have issues in particular you'd like to talk about. Um, that you're interested in. So it's always it's hard to know um, how to cram it all in in four minutes and give you a, a good update. But I will tell you that um, I'll give you a few of the highlights from our um, session last year. All right, I'm so small. I need some. I need glasses. We created a thirty million dollar startup loan fund for businesses across the state. We provided fifteen million dollars in grants to small businesses. Invested. 22 million to support artists and arts and culture organizations, provided more than $100 million to increase childcare capacity and affordability, created a $30 million loan and grant program for Colorado's agricultural, agricultural sector, um, added $8 million to rural economic development programs, and allocated $75 million 
in uh, for ups upskilling and reskilling our state's workforce. So that is just a really brief snapshot of some of the things we did. We um, were hard at work focused on getting the state back and helping people find jobs and uh, you know get through the pandemic the best way they could and, and recover from that. And along those lines also, we have quite a bit of stimulus money that we've um, that we've allocated for various things moving forward. We have four four million dollars four hundred million dollars for housing, four hundred and fifty million dollars for behavioral health, fifty million dollars for education, and uh, and several million dollars allocated for economic recovery in a number of different areas. So we're going through a really robust process right now with lots of stakeholder meetings and um, subcommittees bringing people and communities uh, impacted together to figure out how to create some transformational change in some of those areas so that Colorado looks different in the future and better. Better serves um, the people of Colorado and better positions for um, to recover from the economic impacts of the, uh, you know, the negative impacts of the pandemic and other things that may come down the pike in the future. So lots of work. There's no rest during the interim for legislators, which is good. We get to meet, get out, and meet constituents. So I've been doing um, doing a lot of that um, personally during the interim, working on legislation moving forward in. Um, several areas, wildfire, behavioral health, zero waste and sustainability, media issues, um, lots of different things that I've been working on this summer. And I've toured the district and had the uh, opportunity to chat with you know, fire chiefs and take tours and uh, visit a lot of our nonprofits in the district providing services to, to the residents of House District 25. Um, and also, I've chaired, uh, Senator Story mentioned a lot of the interim committees and, and things she's been serving on, and uh, all legislator, many legislators serve on interim committees um, as well. And I've been chairing the Wildfire Committee, which is really, really important for me. I've um, really been digging into that issue for a long time. I, I was also on the committee a few years ago. And so wildfire issues are important to you guys, so they're important to me. And so um, the committee has taken, um, we took a field trip, we have another field trip planned, we're learning everything we possibly can about wildfire in our communities and how we can make a difference through mitigation and suppression and prevention and all the different tools we have in the toolbox. And we have, we're very fortunate here in Jefferson County to have really great fire chiefs um, some I think you'll be hearing from tonight. So uh, reach out if you have any questions about anything. I'll hang out at the end. And thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Lisa. Um, yes, we do have two wonderful fire chiefs with us tonight. As you know, it's been pretty hot out. In fact, when I got here tonight, I thought I was going to pass out. We opened all the doors and everything we could to cool it off, so I apologize for it being so warm. But partly because of that, we have some issues, and so our fire chiefs are going to talk a little bit about that. We've got Jacob Blair with Elk Creek and Skip Sherlock with um, Inner Canyon. Thank you. I mean, we want to thank the Prairie, uh, Prairie Council for inviting us tonight. My name is Skip Sherla, I'm the Chief of Inner Canyon, and tonight Elk Creek's Chief Jake where we're going to talk to you a little bit and be here to answer some questions. So a brief interview, our overview of our departments. Inner Canyon is 52 square miles, we're up to about 500 calls a year, 62% of those are EMS calls, meaning we're transporting patients down to the Denver Metro Area Hospitals on a pretty regular basis. We are seeing an increase in call volume as well as acuity, and about 95% of Inner Canyon's uh, members are volunteers, which means that your neighbors and people that you know who volunteer are getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning, leaving dinner with their families to go spend two or three hours on a call with us and take someone down to the, uh, to the emergency room. Um, a common theme you're going to hear tonight, we're going to talk about, is a decline in volunteerism and how that affects us. Uh, it's a nationwide trend. Uh, we've kind of fallen near that trend, but uh, allow Chief Ware to give an update on his department. All right. 
Elk Creek, I think a lot of people uh, are familiar with us. We have 98 square miles. We're a combination department. We have four firefighter paramedic or EMTs on shift. They're paid career firefighters and 29 very dedicated volunteers. Right now we actually have 13 rookies that are hopefully going to join the rank of the uh, full volunteers at the end of the year. We run right around, last year we were at 1,375 calls. This year we're on track to do about the same, maybe a little bit more. And just like Skip, uh, we have right around 63% our EMS. We usually end up transporting about 600 people down the hill with our fire-based EMS programs. The one thing we did want to talk about is wildfire danger. Even though the days are getting shorter, the nights are cooler. I think it was this morning on my way in, it was about 34 degrees in my house, which is great. Fire danger is not now. Um, last year, if everybody remembers the uh, troublesome fire, these troublesome up in Granby, in October it ran 100,000 acres in a 24 hour period in October up in Granby. We had snow by now last year. Uh, what we haven't had is any measurable precip for quite some time. The first part of our fire season here was wet. We had an unbelievably wet spring, it broke several records. What that did was create a bunch of grass. And now all the predictions are we're supposed to be warmer and drier all the way into the end of October. So fire season's not done, so please pay attention to it. 90% uh, of all wildland fires are, are human caused. So you'll probably see a lot of us doing different things. Once we have significant weather days, red flag days, uh, high wind events, you'll probably see a lot more of us floating around, we usually increased staffing. Historically, we haven't done that in October, but with the way things are shaping up at the end of September into October, you'll probably see that happening more as we move on. The next thing we're going to talk about is a lot of our programs. Uh, what we started doing is integrating a lot of our programs. We, we work really well with all of our district, with our partners up here. And one of the things we started doing about a year ago was looking at scale of economy, or economy of scale. And if we're working on a program, why are we doing something different than Inner Canyon is doing? Because we're both doing essentially the same thing. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is a new program we kicked off last year. Uh, it's called Community Connect. This program allows people to give us information about their dwelling. Now, we, we always have people, why? In the fire service, we've always pre-planned all of our commercial dwellings. We, in, in the past, we had notebooks, we have all kinds of data on our tablets. I know nearly everything about this building, from doorways, alarm panels, water, everything. And what that is for firefighters, when they respond here, it gives them all the workable intelligence on this building and allows us to be more efficient. Historically, it's never been able to be done on personal residences. The way it's, it was done in the past is you guys would call me, we'd work up a note, I'd give it to dispatch, we'd go into CAD system. The one dispatch that was trying to manage a significant emergency event, whether it's a fire, whatever, is now trying to look at notes while dispatching all of us. We've actually joined up with our, our company that does dispatching for Community Connect, and that's Bridge That Gap. So that gives you, the residents, the ability to input information into our database about your dwelling. Critically important. What it does is it will give you the ability to talk about your house, what some of the things that are important, electrical shutoff, gas shutoff, any of those things would be very important to us when we arrive on the fire. And what it does is it shaves off time for a lot of us to do our operational roles on the fire. People, putting your name and your contact information into that is, is critically important. You have no idea how many times we get to a house because uh, smoke detectors going off inside the house. We don't have the ability to reach the property owner. But if people can start putting information in there, we'll have that ability. We can look in there, we can see the property owner, we can call somebody on a cell phone and say, hey, for instance, we had a garbage truck that ran into a house and nobody was home. Pretty awkward. Uh, we had no ability to contact that individual. Same next thing is bedrooms. Talk about where bedrooms are in your house. Anything that would help us when you do respond to, an, to a fire or any sort of emergency at your dwelling. The other thing is people. If you have anybody, oh man, that one hurt. People, not ambulatory, special needs, anything like that. If you put that in there, it's going to help us do our job better. So, we have flyers in the back, Community Connect. There's a QR code on it. Please get in there. Um, it, it's a very important program. We have right around 6,500, 6,800 houses in our district. Every about six months, we start hammering this down, and we do get a lot of people putting information in there. 
It's very important for us, and it's for us to help you. So, Community Connect, we'll put it all over our social media here, probably starting tomorrow after this, but flyers in the back. I'm going to share them on this last part. Right. We'll probably, we had like, what, 20 minutes? <laughs> Good deal. A few other programs we're doing together, and just about everything we're doing, we're doing together with Elk Creek. Um, we're doing a uh, free roadside chipping program. We're going to be doing 600 homes this year. We're down to uh, 400. We have about 150, 175 more homes to do. If the crews get done early, what we're going to do is we're going to open that up again. Go to either one of our websites, and you'll see in the Car for Wildfire Division section an area to sign up for the chipping program. We also do, uh, we're working on our Community Wildfire Protection Plan. We're updating that together. Um, the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is something we've been uh, engaged in for quite a while with the districts, not only our district, but North Fork and Indian Hills. We've been conducting a feasibility study on consolidation. But what that means is we are having the decline in volunteerism. Our calls are going up, the acuity is going up. We can't cover that with what we have. We need to, we need to, get, we need to help each other. And so it makes sense to see if we can work together as one unit. Does this make sense? In our minds, it seems to, but what we've done is we've hired an outside third party to do this study for us and let us know if what we're thinking at all makes sense. When this report is done, it's going to be forward-facing. We're going to make sure that you see it. We're going to meet with you as much as you'd like and talk to you about where we're at with it. But um, we expect that to be done around uh, mid-hall or so, because that they get off the stage. <laughs> all right, uh, so... So, uh, more to come with that, much more to come. We're going to be somewhere around here when we're done. Last thing I'll do for uh, Commissioner Dow Kemper is a uh, Go Rams, CSU Rams. Yeah. No, CSU Rams. You know? Okay. Um, you know, I actually have CU football tickets, but I'm a graduate of CSU. So, I, it's CU, CSU, I love them both. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Leslie Jopemper, our county commissioner. Thanks so much, Shirley. Hi, everyone. How are you tonight? Thanks so much for being here. It's good to see you. It's so nice to see you in person. And I just have to give a huge shout out to the Comfort Area Council because despite the pandemic, the council continued to make sure that we were well informed about what's going on in our community. So thank you very much, Shirley, and to the board members of the Conifer Area Council. I'm Leslie Donkin, I have the honor of serving as your county commissioner in District 3 and representing Conifer. I serve with Commissioners Kraft Buck, as well as uh, Commissioner Kerr, uh, too. And I wanted to just say, some of you may have heard we had a visitor to Jefferson County yesterday. It was an honor to welcome President Biden to our county, who is touring NREL and talking about issues related to historic wildfires, job creation, renewable energy. But the best part was having an opportunity, albeit only 15 to 20 seconds, to talk with him about how critical modernizing our infrastructure is and addressing, reducing the risk related to wildfire yesterday. That was very important to us. So we got our handshake in, we made sure to mention that to the president. I also want to give a special shout out to the Jeffco Sheriff's Office because they work security detail for the president as they do for dignitaries. So thank you very much to the Sheriff's Office. We appreciate you. You heard Representative Cutter talk a little bit about uh, American Rescue Plan funding, what the state is doing. I want to share with you that in Jefferson County, we will receive $113 million in American Rescue Plan funding. We already have $120 million in requests. That funding can only be used for COVID-19 related issues. However, it can also be used for broadband infrastructure, which I know is an issue. Yes, I got a cheer in the crowd on that one. We often joke that if you're an elected official and you figure out the broadband issue, job security for a whole while, we say. But we have a team at the county that's actually doing an inventory of broadband related issues countywide. Where are the gaps? What's working well? And we're paying a lot of attention to underserved areas. And we know this is a real issue for our Fitchhills community. So if you have any thoughts you want to share with me, please do so. I'll be around after the town hall today as well. We also want to take a moment to thank those of you, our community members, and there's still time, who's, who have weighed in 
on how we should prioritize American Rescue Plan dollars. Same thing for our businesses as well. If you go to jetco.us, on our homepage, you'll see a community survey. So please be sure to fill that out if you have a moment. I also want to touch on wildfire, but briefly, you heard Heather talk about some of the planning and zoning changes that we're looking at. Those changes, in part, came right out of the work of the Jetco Wildfire Task Force. And I want to take a moment to thank uh, Chief Ware, to thank Chief Sherlock, Shirley, all of the members from the Conifer area who represented you on that task force. The task force will now evolve into the Wildfire Commission. Our last day is tomorrow. County staff will be giving an update on where we stand with those recommendations. I won't go into those in detail since uh, Heather touched on this a little bit earlier. The other area I wanted to share with you is that I also serve on the Colorado Fire Commission. I'm one of uh, two county commissioners that was um, selected to serve on that Colorado Fire Commission. The reason I share that with you is the governor has issued a letter, a request to the Colorado Fire Commission to focus on the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface. As we see an increase in population, how do we think thoughtfully and strategically and work together with our partners to continue to reduce wildfire risk? How do we think about defensible space, planning and zoning codes, hardening of homes? Some of those issues also align with the task force recommendations but I can't tell you how excited I am to serve on the WUI committee, which is part of the commission that will be providing those recommendations back to the governor, and we'll also look at potential statutory changes as well. So more details to come on that. And given time, because I see Angela, I see you standing up right now. I wanted to just briefly mention, you heard Chief Sherlock talk about uh, EMT calls. Uh, Colorado is poised to receive $400 million in opioid settlement money. For Jefferson County, that means about $1.3 million specifically for our region, which also includes Gilpin and Clear Creek, for prevention, education, treatment, and more. So we'll be working very closely with our uh, fire chiefs, law enforcement, human services, mental health experts, and others to think about how we best address and fight this opioid epidemic right here in our community. Thanks so much, everyone. I appreciate it. It's good to see you all. I look forward to answering questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. OK, that is the end of the presentations, but they are still here and ready to talk to you. Um, if you have any questions, concerns, or whatever, please stick around. We do have to be out of here a little bit before 9, so just keep that in mind. But if you'd like to stick around and talk to our presenters, we'd sure appreciate that. Um, one last shout out to Tiffany and Christy with Remax Alliance for their community support of tonight's meeting. <laughs> And also a shout out for Sharon Twope with My Mountain Town, and we will be getting that link out um, with this town hall meeting in the next day or so. So our next town hall meeting will be the third Wednesday of November, and hopefully it'll be no masks, and you know, hopefully it'll be good. So we'll hope to see you then. Thank you. Thank you.